Your commentator is Basil Rysdale. Now it can be told. History in the making as the mysterious Shangri-La. Actually, the United States Navy aircraft carrier Hornet steams westward across the Pacific. A protecting force of cruisers and destroyers, with the hard-hitting Admiral Halsey in command, slams into a gale, determined to reach a position 400 miles from Tokyo, unless intercepted by the enemy. Packed on the afterdeck of the Hornet are 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers. Never before have these huge planes been launched from a carrier. High explosive and demolition bombs are made ready for the destruction of military objectives in Japan. Colonel, now Major General Doolittle, with Captain Mark Mitcher, commander of the aircraft carrier Hornet, who was once decorated by Japan, now gives his medal to be returned to the Japs on the tail of a bomb. Not until they are miles at sea do these men know definitely the mission for which they have volunteered. Now their thoughts go back to their months of careful preparation, clothed in the greatest secrecy. Only Colonel Doolittle knew that Japan was to be their target. Now they realize that the miniature cities laid out for practice bombing near an American airfield duplicated military objectives in Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagoya, Kobe and Osaka. Even the strategy of flying in low over targets is an important part of the training for the greatest surprise raid in the history of aerial warfare. Not even certain they can take off successfully from a carrier that was never designed for launching army bombing planes. Closer and closer they approach enemy controlled waters and the danger of discovery. Jimmy Doolittle and Captain Mitcher discuss every detail of the carrier takeoff. Suddenly a strange vessel is sighted. It's a Jap patrol boat and the task force intends to destroy it before a warning can be radioed to Japan. goes to pick up Jap survivors. It is feared they have flashed the news to heavy Jap naval forces in the vicinity. Survivors are picked up and brought aboard. Jimmy Doolittle asks Admiral Halsey to go in closer for another hour and a half. And now the signal is flashed for the takeoff, 10 hours ahead of schedule. The added distance to be flown increases the hazards. There is no hesitation. They man their planes. Doolittle pilots the lead plane. There's a breathless moment as the big bomber gathers speed. It's airborne. The first army bomber ever to be launched from a carrier is safely in the air. Now they know it can be done, and they time their takeoff with the upsurge of the bow of the carrier in the heavy seas. to go. Nose wheel lifted and wing flaps down for maximum lift and the quickest possible takeoff. Another B-25 to join the formation circling over the task force until all the 16 planes can get into the air. Tokyo ahead. Here is America's answer to treachery. Secret Norden bomb sites have been removed from these planes and replaced by a makeshift device costing about 20 cents. These historic pictures 
round out the electrifying news of Tokyo's first taste of American vengeance in April 1942. Loaded with eggs of destruction, they wing through a fog-ridden dawn. One of the last planes to go almost meets disaster on the takeoff from the rolling and pitching deck of the carrier. It drops dangerously, but good piloting saves it. The planes sweep in without being discovered. They separate into groups to attack the several objectives carefully selected by means of accurate intelligence to ensure that only targets of military value will be hit. Colonel Doolittle himself has told of flying over the Emperor's palace and refraining from bombing it, though he could have left it in ruins. Here are the last pictures to come out of Tokyo before Pearl Harbor. They show the Japs rehearsing with all the realism possible for air raids, which they assured the Emperor and people of Japan would never be experienced. The defense system, as they practice it here, proved disorganized and panic-stricken when Doolittle and his men catch them flat-footed. Not a single shell fragment hit a plane. The loss of face by Tokyo may well have driven the Japs into the disastrous midway expedition and its staggering losses of ships and men. This Jap-made scene of Tokyo swept by fire following an earthquake shows clearly what must have happened in the many areas hit by the hundreds of incendiary bombs. Later in China, the flyers who bailed out safely are decorated by Madame Chiang Kai-shek. The smiling Jimmy Doolittle does not yet know the fate of some of his comrades. All survivors, except the crew of one plane which landed safely in Russia and were interned, reach America and are decorated by General Arnold, head of the American Army Air Forces. Doolittle wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. Mark these men well, General Tojo and his barbarous war bandits, who boast that they had executed some of the flyers captured. General Arnold replies to this brutal news with fighting words. Those men died as heroes. We must not rest. We must redouble our efforts until the inhuman warlords who committed this crime have been utterly destroyed. Tokyo Raiders, Captain Watson right and Lawson left, tell of targets bombed and vengeance to come. Our takeoff from the, uh, the Hornet was made successfully. It wasn't as much the, the length of takeoff that bothered us, it was the width. It was about a four foot clearance between the right wing tip and the island, and the left wing tip hanging over the deck on the left hand side. Trip in was uneventful. My target, my first target was a tank factory in the south of Tokyo. My alternative targets being an oil storage tank and a, a railroad yard. We were fortunate in getting through the uh, anti-aircraft and reaching our number one target. It dropped the entire load on this tank factory and had the uh, satisfaction of seeing two of the bombs score direct hits. Captain Lawson speaks for his comrades. We all feel pretty strongly about these boys that we were with. We had all been pretty close. Large family, almost like brothers. We'd known each other from a year to a year and a half before this raid ever came off. We knew their families, their children, and if there's any way to get even, we'll certainly try.